Good morning, Cedar Point Church. Would you stand with us today? Let's get ready to worship. Is my 
seated for just a minute. We're going to just continue as an act of worship. We're going to baptize some people this morning. One of the ways that we uh, make a public profession is through baptism. As a matter of fact, here at Cedar Point, it's the way we make a public profession. And so uh, we're glad that you're here. If you are with somebody and you're supposed to be the picture taker or the camera taker, you get wherever you want. I don't want you to miss this moment. It's such a great moment. And so we're going to start right now and um, let's begin. Who's, who's first this morning? Amber, come on up here. So get on in here, sweetie, can you? Tell everybody, I know who you are, but tell everybody who you are. This is Cambry, and her parents are right here up front. They've been to the church almost from the beginning, and uh, when we were meeting in the donut room. And so, Cambry, when did you give your life to Jesus? In kindergarten. So that's probably 10 or 15 years ago. Just, anyway, we're going to baptize you. I'm going to have Pastor Aaron, our children's pastor. I'm going to pray for you, and then he's going to baptize you. Is that okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Cambry. I thank you, Lord, for her family. I thank you, Lord, that they serve you. And that she's here today because they brought her and because she's made a decision that you'll, you are hers. So in Jesus' name, we just pray for her. And we thank you that this will always mark her life of when she said to everybody, I belong to Jesus. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's awesome, Cambry. Cambry, Cambry, look right over there at that lady right there, all right? <laughs> it's a quick take. All right, who's next? Come on up, yeah. Come on in the water. I know who you are, but tell everybody who you are. Jerry Schaefer. Jerry, when did you give your life to Jesus? In the year of our Lord, 1970. 1970, all right. And so is this kind of just a recommitment? This is kind of? a rededication. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm going to pray for you, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Jerry. I thank you, Lord, that she's known you since 1970. You've been a part of her life. And, Lord, sometimes we go through seasons where it's just good to remind ourselves of who we belong to and whose we are. And so she's done that today. And I thank you, Father, that she declares that you are hers and she is yours. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and sit down and you can cover your nose up for me. Father, we baptize Jerry in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. It's awesome. I definitely know who you are, but everybody who you are. Amy Jan. And Amy, when did you give your life to Jesus? When I was a little girl, but I rededicated my life when doctors told us we couldn't have children. And so, how, <laughs> how's that story changed? We are 22 weeks pregnant. So. I love Amy. She's a teacher and a coach, has a call to kids' lives. You've been here for several years now. And yes. Your family comes here, and so it's pretty cool, right? Yes. All right, I'm going to pray for you, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up Amy, Lord. She's dear to me. I thank you, Father, that she has given her life to you. And I thank you, Lord, that you've been faithful to her. Lord, we're grateful for the blessing that her and Ryan have coming, Lord. And so thank you so much for that. Lord, let this day just mark her. Let it be forever settled in her that she belongs to you and that you belong to her. And that, Lord, she'll always remember this moment when she again declared publicly, Jesus is mine and I'm his. And so we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's pretty warm, isn't it? Yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> Father, we baptize Amy in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just right there if you will. How are you doing today? Can you tell everybody your name? 
Has Destiny you know when you gave your life to Jesus? About a year and a half and two years ago. That's awesome. And who's here with you today? My parents. Your parents. Are you pretty excited? Well, I'm going to pray for Heston, and, and we're going to baptize him. So, <clears throat> Father, we thank you, God, for Heston. God, we thank you for just his life. God, I thank you for his heart. He's such a wonderfully kind young man, Lord, and I just... I see just the call that you've placed on him, God, and we just thank you for this moment, God. We just pray that it'll just mark his life forever, God, that it'll just be just a moment that he cherishes as he just moves closer to you. We thank you for this, God, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hang on just a minute. Do you want to get up here? Just go with him. I'm going to have you. Father, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boy. Let me get a picture with you guys. Isn't that awesome? Amen, man. I don't think I think that's it for this service. We do, we're doing nine in the next service, so it's pretty cool, and we're just excited about everything God's doing. We're going to worship a little bit more. Is that right? Let's everybody stand up again and just kind of engage with God's presence and be grateful for what He's done for us. are the one thing. Lord, I know in my own life, man, there's just so many times that I just get, I can get caught up pursuing things other than you. Relationships, I make them more, some relationships more important than you. But Lord, my life is just, it's chaotic, it's void, it's empty. When Jesus, you're not the one thing in my life. And so I pray for each one of us today that there would just be this awareness. And for some of us, we just have to be reminded. I just have to be reminded. And Lord, for others of us, there has to be a discovery of that. And so whatever place that we're in, I pray that the Spirit of God, that the Holy Spirit would just bring that to our mind, bring that to our remembrance, to our thoughts. And so we thank you for it, Father. We thank you, Lord, for all of this. Jesus, in our world right now, in this service right now, let everything that we do point towards you. Let us honor you. Let us value you. Let us recognize you. Let you just be the one that we esteem and we point towards. And Jesus, because you're here, I declare that this is a story-changing place. I call this a growing church with every seat full of people whose stories are being changed by you because people matter to you. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. More importantly, have your way 
in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray for the rest of this service. I pray for our nation. I pray, Father, that there would be an awakening in our country, a spiritual awakening. The answers to our questions, the answers to our challenges are not found in our political leaders. They're found in Jesus. And I pray that the local church all over this nation would rise up and express that. So, Father, pray that you would use me today, help my words speak into people's lives so that they would know that you see them, that you love them, that they matter to you. And because of how good you've been to us, we lean into you right now. We make ourselves vulnerable. We repent of the things that we need to repent of. We forgive those that we need to forgive. And, Lord, just direct us and speak to us. And we thank you for all of that. And, and because of how good you are, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Well, you can be seated. Thank you, Zach. Aren't you glad to be in church today? Yeah, yeah man. I'm glad that you're here, too. We just got, you know, it's just so cool. I love beginnings weekends. You know, we do baptisms. And, and um, I just got to tell you, people giving their lives to Jesus, it's not a small thing to us. It's, it will always be whether we meet in this building and when that place over there gets fixed, meet in there. And if tomorrow, if they said we had to meet out in a field, that would be one of the most important things to us is we want to see people come to Jesus. It's just, it's not a big deal, it's the big deal. And so we're just excited about that. Thanks for being here. Those of you that are here with family and friends to see people get baptized, thank you for being a part of that and celebrating that. A couple of things I want to go over. First of all, I want to show you, I think I'm going to show you a picture of our future. Is that right? So there it is, you're looking at it. No, anyway, so right. So this is just a reminder that, again, we're, we're fixing up. It's going to look different. Uh, it'll look like our platform's going to be bigger than that. And like I said before, we won't have a grand piano in there. And the guy will be a lot older than the guy you're seeing up there. But I mean, just a lot, you know, just a lot of good things going to be taking place. So I'm excited about it. And, um, you know, I, I believe I, you know, they're going to be in there before Easter. And so um, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I didn't say which Easter. I'm just telling you, we're going to be in there before Easter. And so that'll be good. So let's applaud, man. Let's give a clap. And so we're excited about that. Then also, I want to remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock, we're having our Advent service. It's our second annual one. And we did it last year. It exceeded our expectations. It was just a great way to kick off the Christmas season. And so if you don't have anything going, come tonight. Bring your kids with you. It's going to be kid-friendly. And uh, then afterwards, and I know they're going to give you more information and instruction. Are you doing that, Katie? You're not? Okay. Well, somebody will. So, um, and so it'll be, it'll be a good thing. The next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday. At 6 o'clock, we're going to do a communion over the, uh, online, and so um, that's one of the things we, can, we still want to do together is communion, and we just feel like it's just a good opportunity to kind of join everybody together, and so that'll be next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. We'll have more information on that. We started a series a couple of weeks ago called Static, talking about the static in our world and in our life and how things can feel so chaotic. I hope it's spoken to you. Are you ready to get started? Well, like this side is. I don't know so much about this side over here, but you guys, you're ready to get started over here. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Well, grab hold of your Bible and say this with me. Say, this is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I declare this morning, my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll be taught the word of God, and I'll never be the same again. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. If you're still learning your way around the Bible, know this, that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament's before the birth of Jesus. It starts with Genesis. So Genesis is the very first book in your Bible. And so I want to talk to you this morning. We talk about things that create chaos in our life, the things that, that create static where it's hard to just focus on any one thing because there's so many things going on around us. That I think one of the greatest challenges we have is in our thought life. You know, the things that we think about, that, that there's just something about that, that our thoughts, you know, that I've been in situations before me where my circumstances are peaceful, that things around me are good, and yet at the same time, I'm dealing with just either just fear or worry or just, uh, you know, just anger or just different things like that. And even in, with peaceful settings, that my thoughts can be just consuming to me. That, I mean, it's just, that just kind of dictates everything that I do. And so, we, when, whenever we think about that, you know, that, that it can be one of the most powerful things in our world. So, we're going to look at that this morning. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. 
And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So first of all, the very first place that, you know, it talks about a serpent, but this is really the enemy. This is the devil coming up and he's creating a question about what God has said and, and implying some things. And so he said, did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees of the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. So there's a few things going on here. First of all, when you study this, if you'll go back in chapter 2 of Genesis, that Eve had not been created yet, and the instruction of what God expected was given to Adam. And so somewhere along the way, that there was some miscommunication because God didn't say anything about touching it. And yet Eve added that to her thing. That may have been what Adam told her. We don't know. But in all of this, one of the very first things that the enemy wanted to do was, was that he wanted to imply some things. He wanted to imply that you can't trust God. You wanted to, he wanted to imply that God's holding out on us, that there are things that he, that he doesn't want us to have, things that he doesn't want to do. And so just, just so much just kind of just implication. And so when we look at that, we have to know this, that the enemy insinuates things through thoughts. Listen to this. The enemy insinuates things through thoughts about God's instructions and his intentions. See, it's one thing to know what God wants us to do, but it's another thing to understand this, that it's always in our best interest. Now, it may not feel like that at the time. It may feel like, you know, that I, if you're in conflict that, and you are operating by what God wants you to do, that you may feel like you're at a disadvantage because you're not going to lie, you're, you're not going to do certain things, and the other person that you're in conflict with, they seem to have no problem doing any of those things. You feel like, Lord, they have made a disadvantage. But to understand this, that the instructions that the Lord gives us, we have to know what they are, but we also have to know that his intentions are good. Everybody say this. Say, I know, I know. that God, that God. Always, 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 always wants what's best for me. And we, and we just have to remind ourselves that, that, that any time that these thoughts come that want us to question that, that want to create chaos in our life, that want to confuse us or distract us from what God has for us, and, and, you know, and, and even just subtle things in our thoughts. You know, right here, the Lord didn't say they couldn't eat from any tree, just this one tree, because it's not going to be good for you if you do. And so when we think about our thoughts, number one is this, that we have to know where that thought came from. Who told you that? And, and all of us, through our own insecurities, can be hit in certain ways. If we've dealt with rejection for most of our lives, then the enemy can create a sense of paranoia about us. Well, they, they don't like you, or they, you know, that person walked right by you and didn't speak to you. They didn't say anything. They, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, what's wrong with you? Maybe there's other things where you felt like you weren't cared for, and so you've got to be in control now. And so as a result of all of those things, that, that we can just face these issues, face these challenges, face these struggles. But we have to ask ourselves, who told me that? I know that uh, Tina and I, early on in our years, we had, we had two different upbringings. I mean, and, and here's the thing, we all have our own challenges, that I had my own set of insecurities that she had to deal with. And quite honestly... I don't, if, I'd, if I'd not gotten married, I probably would not have been aware of how many I had and how deep they were. But the Lord used her to point those out in me. And so, um, and it's probably using your spouse to do the same thing for you. But uh, for her, because her childhood was so disruptive and chaotic, that there'd be times where, you know, I would say things and I didn't realize the impact that it was having on her. I mean, you know, in my mind, we're arguing and, you know, and so I grew up in home, you know, that if, if you're having an argument, the goal is to win it. And so, you know, then, you know, afterwards she would be hurting and I'm like, we, we were just fighting. Why are you still sad after three days? I mean, you know, it was one of those things. And so um, I got the best of you, but keep trying, you know. So, I mean, that was kind of, you know, and it was just really wrong and all that kind of stuff. But I remember that sometimes things would be happening and she would say, well, I'm not. And she would say, I'm not stupid or I'm not this. And I'm like, I never said those things about you. I don't think those things about you. But I think so many times that there's this narrative that takes place in our mind. That the enemy has convinced us or implied that this is what people think about you. That he's convinced us or implied that this is who you really are. 
And so many times I think that when it comes to our thoughts that we have to ask ourselves, who said that? Was it birthed out of pain that took place? Was it something that the enemy has used just because he knows it's an area that, that you or I struggle with? Who said that? And so our thoughts can be, they can create such static in our life because they get in the way of what God has really said about us. God had really said about her and Adam that they were made in his image. And yet the devil created static by implying that God doesn't want what's best for you, that he's holding out on you. And so because of that, you're really not like him until you do this. So think about the things that you deal with in your thought life. The concerns you have, the anxiety you have, the struggles you have, the things that create anger. The challenges in relationship, the fears you have. What are the thoughts that are swirling around in your mind that create that? To identify those and then ask yourself this question. Who said that? So many times I think if we could, if we could understand like, you know, when somebody says something, somebody says, well, I heard so-and-so. Well, who told you that? And it's like, well, so-and-so. And something like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And it just makes all the difference in the world because then when we know who said it and if we know their character, then we know what weight to put on it. But I know so many times in my own life I never stopped to ask myself that question, who said that? So number one is this, is it? Know where that thought came from. Go with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Now, Philippians is in the New Testament. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You'll keep going. Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And as I've said before, this, this was a letter that Paul wrote while he was in prison. It's one of my favorite letters of his because you can tell that the people that he's writing to, that, that they have a longstanding friendship, that they had partnered together for the work of God. And so he's writing this to him. And so in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, now this is a, that I've gotten to put into practice on more than one occasion. And it's not any fun to put into practice because it usually means I'm worrying about something. So he starts out with this, don't worry about anything. How many of you can use this verse today? How many of you can use that verse today? Don't worry about anything. Don't look at the person next to you and say, I'm not going to worry about you today. I mean, so right? So don't worry about anything. He said, instead, pray about everything. And I have to remind myself. That if I'm worrying about it, it's a pretty good sign I'm not praying about it. So don't worry about anything. If I'm tempted to worry about it, I should pray about it. So he said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. So do we experience God's peace when we worry? No. We experience God's peace when we pray, when we tell God what we need and thank him for all he's done. Then God's peace shows up. Well, he goes on to say, he said, then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. In other words, it won't make sense to us. Our circumstances haven't changed, and yet the peace of God is there. Then he went on to say, he said, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So when we do this, the peace of God guards our heart and guards our mind. Guards it from what? From worry, from anxiety. And then he goes on to say this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix. Everybody say fix. Now, the word fix there means to, to just stay on this. Think about this. He said, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So fix our thoughts on this implying, letting us know that we have a choice, that you and I can decide on what we think about. And God gives us a filter right here that if it's not honorable, if it's not worthy of praise, if it's not admirable, all of those things, then we should, we should realize that I'm not going to think about that. My mind, now again, it's not talking about problem solving because we have to use the wisdom of God to deal with that. But just to sit there and just things that just kind of pour into our mind that we sometimes, I don't know about you, but there are just moments where I just kind of, everything has access to my thought life. And he said, wait, don't do that. Fix your mind on these things. Think about these things. Focus on these things. Let's look at that list again and say, what should I think about? Well, he said that the peace of God will show up and it will guard our hearts. But he said, this final word is, is along with that, fix your thoughts on what is true. But it doesn't stop there. Also, what's honorable? 
And then after honorable, it says right. What's right? What's pure and lovely and admirable? Think about things that are excellent. And I love this last one here, and worthy of praise. In other words, can I take this thought and praise God with it? That's a pretty good filter, isn't it? If I can take this thought and praise God with it, then it's worthy of my thinking about it, of my fixing my thoughts on these things. And then he goes on to say, in verse 9, he says this, Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So again, in a world where there seems to be so little peace, there's conflict everywhere we look. You get on TV, there's conflict. You get on social media, there's conflict. You go to your family reunion, there's conflict. Some of you around your family for Thanksgiving, what was there? Conflict. Yeah, some of you knew what the answer was. And so, yeah, I mean, we have those things. So, so how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, the things we're tempted to worry about, we pray about instead. We tell God what we need. We thank him for what he's done. It says, then his peace will show up and guard our hearts and guard our minds. And then any time that a thought wants to come in, it's kind of like we got this guard keeper there saying, let's see, are you, wor- are you true? Are you right? Are you just? Are you worthy of praise? You're not? Oh, no. You can't come in here. Oh, you are? Come in. Stay as long as you want. And so this is what we should give access to our thought life. You and I can make decisions as to what we're going to meditate on, as to what we're going to think about on a regular basis. And and our decision to do that will contribute to the amount of peace that you and I have in our life, in our world. You know... There's just something about that's powerful about different seasons we go through. I've, I've been through seasons where I didn't have the resources that I need. Where we just, you know, we were having a hard time paying our electric bill, having a hard time, you know, doing different things. We've been through some seasons like that. I've shared with you before that there was a season in ministry that we had to hawk stuff to keep our lights on. One time we had to, I remember that we were at the, the pawn shop. I, I remember the first time I ever went in, I was, I was grown. I was in ministry, and I went in, and I told the guy, I said, I don't know how this works. I've never had to do this before. So he told me. He and I became friends. I saw him on a monthly basis. <laughs> Thought about sending him an invite to my kid's baptism service. But I remember one of the hard days, as I've shared with you before, that, you know, we, 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 we came home. We had one of those notes on our door that said, you know, you're going to get your lights turned off, and we have a little baby. And so I remember going there, and we had hawked everything else we had of any value. And what we had wasn't worth much. And he said, this still won't get you where you need. And so we took our wedding rings off and gave them to him. That's not a fun day for a husband as a man, you know, to have your wife take her wedding band off and say, here, just in order to keep our lights on. And so in those seasons, man, it would try to be so disruptive of my peace. And when chaos shows up, it's amazing how you can blame, you know, you you know, you and your spouse can be in conflict. You can have contention. You can have all of those things. And yet, even in those moments, if, if we understand this, that this is just a moment. It's just a season. This isn't going to be our permanent story. If we'll stay together through this, and if we'll walk through this together, and trust God together, and pray about it, and just know that, know that he's bringing provision our way, and, and this just helps us till we get there. That instead of these thoughts that are coming in that are overwhelming, it's like, hey, you're failing. Who do you think you are? And we begin to change what we allow in our mind, and we begin to see our future different because we have confidence in God's plan for us that this won't always be what we deal with. And then we begin to think thoughts that are worthy of praise. God, part of our story is that we'll encourage people that may be in this season of life right now and let them know that it won't always be like this. And so it's worthy of praise. We pray about it. We think about these things, fix our thoughts on these things, and then as we do that, we walk in the peace of God. It curbs the static in our life. Number two is this. Be picky about the thoughts you think. Be picky about the thoughts you think. We need to be picky about the thoughts we think. Look at number three here, and we'll close with this. Go with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. 
you're in Philippians and Romans is a few books before Philippians. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And he said, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. So this is truly the way to worship him. So Paul starts out in this chapter saying, look, he said, I want, he said I'm pleading with you to give your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Now, in our culture, that's not as powerful as it was in their culture because they lived in a culture where people were offering sacrifices for different things. And so they knew that a sacrifice was a place that you did not get up from. That if they sacrificed an animal, that it laid there. But he said, we're different because we're a living sacrifice, which means nobody forcefully takes us to that place. Nobody, nobody makes it a once and for all, but we do that ourselves, that we go there and we willingly lay ourselves down on the altar of God's will. And because we're a living sacrifice, at any time, I can choose to get up off of that altar and do my own thing. But he said, one of the ways that I worship God, besides coming together, gathering together, and singing, is that I can worship him by offering myself and saying, Lord, I just want to do what you want me to do. Lord, I want to handle this situation you want me to handle. I want to deal with this person the way you want me to deal with them. That we do that, that we become a living sacrifice. That we willingly lay ourselves down and we have to make that decision to do that over and over again. To surrender ourselves to the will of God for our everyday life. And then he goes on to say, this is truly the way to worship him. And then he said this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. In other words, don't let culture or other relationships be our greatest influence. Don't copy the, the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Everybody say transform. transform. Into a new person by changing the way you think. So he said, let God transform you. Now the word transform here is kind of the same word we get the word metamorphosis from. And metamorphosis, when you think about that, probably a great example. I remember when I was like, I think in first grade, that our teacher got a caterpillar. Anybody have that same, did you have the same first grade teacher I did? That you had a teacher get a caterpillar and put it in a jar? How many had that first grade teacher? Anybody? And so we got to watch it over time, and eventually it went into its own cocoon, and then it came out, and it was longer a caterpillar. What was it? It was a butterfly. And it looked significantly different, didn't it? I mean, it was the same creature, but just over this period of time, this change took place that it was really unrecognizable in how it looked. And so he said right here that what can happen to you and I is that we can be transformed. We don't have to follow the culture of our day. We don't have to follow necessarily the things that we were raised with. But we can transform into such a dramatic change. It's a metamorphosis in our life. And he said, this is the way it takes place. He said, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. He said, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so for us, we have to understand this, that changed thinking leads to changed behavior. That we start out with, as I said earlier, knowing where that thought came from. Is that a God thought? Was it something that the Lord told me, or is it, or is it birthed out of some pain that I had years ago? Well, you can't trust anybody. Where'd that thought come from? Well, they're mad at you. Where'd that thought come from? You'll never amount to anything. Where'd that thought come from? You know, God's just going to tell you no anyway. He doesn't want you to have stuff. He doesn't want, want your life to go well. Where did that thought come from? And, and so to begin to start with that and then also to filter our thoughts and to say, is it good? Is it admirable? Is it honest? Is it worthy of praise? If it's not, then it has, I'm not going to just let it just run rampant in my thought life, but I'm going to stand guard and just fix my mind on those things because I know that after I give my life to Jesus and, and he comes and lives on the inside of me and that I'm born again, that that begins a change in my heart. But my life begins to be changed whenever my thinking changes. He said, how do I know what he wants me to think? Get into the scripture. Get into the word. You know, connect with people and journey with people that have a walk with the Lord. And, and I would even say this, like you want. Connect with people that have a marriage like you want. Connect with people that have a relationship with God like you want. And then 
Watch your thoughts and just be open to saying, I've always thought this and maybe I thought wrong about it and I want to change the way that I live. And so I want to change the way that I live. It begins with my decision to make Jesus Lord of my life and to, to ask him into my heart. But then it's lived out on a daily basis through that surrender and by changing the way I think. It transforms us. It transforms you. It transforms me to change the way that I think. To change the way that I think about marriage. To change the way that I think about parenting. To change the way that I think about friendships. To change the way that I think about church. There's some people that have never gone to church because somebody told them something negative about church or about preachers. Or maybe they had an experience that was painful for them. And so the enemy seized upon that, grabbed hold of it, and at some point we have to ask ourselves, who told me that? And then as a result of that, that some of you are here today because you changed the way you thought about church. Some of you... Your marriage is different because you changed the way that you thought about marriage, about what you thought about your spouse. Some of you, your future is different because you've changed what you believe God wants about your future. And so changed thinking leads to changed behavior. And I just know in my own life that it can get so comfortable just thinking about the things that I know, things that I'm familiar with, things about the way that I was brought up or things that I was taught. Like I remember, you know, growing up that stubbornness was kind of a virtue. Well, I'm just stubborn like my, like my family is. So I'm, I'm getting ready to ruin some of your worlds, okay? <laughs> stubbornness is not a virtue. Persevering is a virtue. To persevere and, 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 you know, and to be able to endure hardship, that's a virtue. But being stubborn... I remember one year that uh, when we were in New Mexico, uh, we were there for 17 years. I'm from here. We were there for 17 years. And they were going to do a fundraiser, and it was called Donkey Basketball. Everybody seen, ever seen a donkey basketball game? Yeah. And I thought, how hard can donkey basketball be? <laughs> and so they said, hey, do you want to be on the donkey basketball team? And I'm like, it's probably the one time I can star on a court. I mean, I, I can get on that donkey. It was like one of the, it was one of the worst nights of my life. No matter what you wanted that donkey to do, it's going to do the opposite. The final score is like four to two. I remember it would just start running and taking off. Okay, praise God, now we're making time. And then he would stop, and I'm like trying to hang on. I've got hold of him. Or if I'm, I'm like trying to get him to move, you know, I'm kicking him. and I, You know, I mean, like you're supposed to. I'm not, I felt like getting off of him and kicking him a few times, but I wasn't sure he wouldn't kick me back. And so I thought about, man, it, I wonder if this is how the Lord sees me sometimes. Or the people around me, is this how they see me? And so I had to change the way that I thought about stubbornness. And understand that the Lord wants me to be bendable to him. Pliable with him. That he wants me to persevere but not confuse perseverance with stubbornness. There's something powerful about humility. And so when we get that, it... When we understand that in our thoughts, it changes the way we live. The wrong thoughts can hold us captive and keep us from what God has for us and create static and turmoil in our lives where we can never enjoy relationships. We can never enjoy the blessings of God and the goodness of God. We can never really experience the beauty of being forgiven. Because each one of those things are held captive because of the thoughts that we have. And Paul was talking about if we give our, relations, our lives to Jesus, that if you really want to see real change take place, change the way you think. And it deals with the static and chaos in our life, and all of a sudden we begin to experience peace. The peace of God which passes understanding. Again, number three is this. Change thinking leads to change behavior. Let's do this. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a minute. Let's just spend a moment with God and just let the Spirit of God, let the Holy Spirit bring up to your mind and to your thoughts maybe some thoughts that have held you captive, kept you away from what God has for you, stood in the way of real change in your life, 
kept you from pursuing the things that he wants to do in you and through you? Let's just take a moment and just, just let the Lord just in his goodness, in his sweetness, just deal with us. To confront us and to correct us and encourage us. To lead us. He'll give you God thoughts in this moment if you just make yourself available to him. Let's just spend a moment with him. Father, I do thank you for the peace of God that passes understanding. I, I mean, it just in situations where there seems like there should be no reason why we have peace, that your peace shows up because instead of worrying, we pray. Instead of complaining to people around us, we talk to you. Father, because we question anytime thoughts in our minds, we, we ask ourselves who that thought came from. Whose thought is that? But we fix our minds on things that are worthy praise Father I thank you that as we do this we take this seriously we give our lives to you then we begin to live that change out on a daily basis because we begin to change the way we think we begin to see it through the eyes of your word of your promises we begin to see ourselves through the eyes of your promises not through the eyes of our mistakes not through the eyes of our failures or disappointments not through the eyes of, of being wounded or being a wounder. We see our eyes selves through the eyes of the grace of God and by what Jesus has done for us. And then our change is a metamorphosis proportion. And so we thank you for that, Father. Thank you for the goodness and thank you for your spirit, your presence dealing with us right now and calling us to you to start this journey or to renew it or to assure it. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, before we go today, man, if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you want to do that today, I would love to pray for you. You know, being a Christian is more than just believing in God, but it's this awareness that all of us, all of us have blown it. I have, you have, we've all sinned, right? I mean, there's not any of us that are perfect. And even though God is love, he's also just. And because he's just, he can't ignore my sin. He can't ignore our sin. So Jesus came so that justice could be satisfied. That he loved me and you so much that he came and he said, put their sin on me and judge it on me. And so when we make Jesus Lord of our life, we step out from underneath judgment. We become children of God. And we're made right with God. It says that we're justified. In other words, he deals with us just as if I'd never sinned. And so if you've never made him Lord and you want to do that today, man, I'd love to pray for you. Second of all, if you're here and you say, Rick, I've done that, but honestly, man, I've gotten off track and I'm not where I used to be. I'm not where I need to be. And I want to get back to that place. Can I? Absolutely you can. You say, how do you know? Because, man, I've gotten off track before too. I know what that's like. I got bitter. I let my bitterness carry me to a dark place. And that may not be what happened to you. Just Maybe you got busy, distracted, whatever. But you just know you're not where you were with the Lord and you want to get back to that place if that's you I want to pray for you and then lastly if you're here and you say you know sometimes I think I'm a Christian but other times I, I struggle with what if I'm not and I wish I could just settle it I wish I could leave here knowing that I'm saved that I'm his well I believe you can and I want that for you as well so if that's you I want to pray for you so for any one of those three things whether to give your life to Jesus for the very first time or to recommit your life to him just rededicate it to him or to just leave assured, just knowing that you're his. If that's you on any one of those three things, I want to pray for you. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, 
just so I know who I'm praying for, just so I know who I'm praying for, if that's you, would you just raise your hand for just a moment and keep it up? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to join these? Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Awesome. I want to pray for you. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for each person that's raised their hand. Lord, I know that they they matter to you. They're precious to you. They're important to you. And you've pursued them today. And Lord, if this is their very first time, I thank you that as they make Jesus Lord and, and accept you as their Savior, that they become a new creature today, a new creature in Christ, that old things are passed away and all things are become new. And Father, if they're recommitting their lives, rededicating their lives, I thank you that you'll restore the joy of their salvation, that they'll leave here reconnected to the plan and purpose of God, free of shame, free of condemnation, free of guilt, assured that they're yours. And lastly, Lord, for any of those that struggle with, am I really saved? Am I really yours? I pray they leave here today. They'll know they're yours, not because they feel like it, because some days I don't feel like it. And they'll know they're yours, not because they always act like it, because some days I certainly don't act like it. But they'll know they're yours because you said whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. So on the days I don't feel like it, and on the days I don't act like it, I know I'm yours because my confidence is not in how good I feel or how good I am. My confidence is in what Jesus has done and what you've promised. And so I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now, look, I prayed for you, and that's good, man. We should pray for each other. But around here, you learn real quick that God doesn't want a religion. He wants a relationship with you. And in a relationship, you and he talk to each other. So I want to lead you in a prayer. Where you're talking to him, you personally are talking to him. And I want you to be able to be bold and not hindered or intimidated. And since we're for you, I'm going to ask everybody in here to repeat after me. Because it's good for the rest of us to affirm our faith. But let's all say this, but if you raise your hand, you make this yours. You make this yours. So let's all say this. Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I know what that means. That means I'll do what you say to the best of my ability and with your help. I'll follow you. I'll walk with you all the days of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for all my sins. And I believe with all my heart that you were raised from the dead so I could be forgiven. I call upon you now. And ask you to forgive me and to live in me. And I thank you for forgiving me and saving me and loving me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Isn't that awesome? It's so awesome. In just a minute, Christine's going to come up here, right? Going to come up here and give you guys some instructions. Before they, we do that, I'm going to have you. Steve, you and Sherry stand up real quick, would you? These guys are getting married today, and so we want to say a big congratulations to them. Isn't that exciting? I love Beginnings Weekend, man. We have people get baptized, people dedicate their kids, they give blood, and they get married. And so it's just a great day, right? You're like, are we going to do that? Yeah, right now. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be later on. So anyway, I love you guys. God bless you. Give Christine a hand as she comes up here. Such a good message. Thank you, Pastor Rick, for that. I know that as we go on being Christ followers, I don't care how long you've been a follower of Jesus, changing your thoughts is always something that we're going to have to do. And so for those of you that made that decision today, just know that it's an ongoing process, and we as a church are now here with you uh, to journey with you in your next steps. And so my friend at the back door, he has a black bag in his hand, and in it it has a Bible, and it has some information about our growth track in there. Growth track is going to be um, doing its first step next Sunday, so you'll want to check that out. We have it online at cedarpoint.church where you can go through growth track and figure out the vision of the church and decide whether or not you want Cedar Point to even be your church home. But then there's also some other things in there like learning healthy habits of a believer. You'll take a personality assessment and a spiritual gifts test and just a lot of other things that will help you with your next steps. And the other thing 
is I'm gonna ask one person per family to grab one of these info cards. It's in the seat back in front of you. Just fill it out. For those of you that made a decision today, there's a spot on the bottom where you can choose which one of those pertain to you. And of course, on the back, there's an area for prayer requests or comments. And we do look over these every single week as a staff. We address any needs on there that there might be on the card. And just know we use it as a tool to best serve you and your family. And then we'll drop them in the buckets. Today, our, pa our uh, ushers are going to pass buckets down the row, so you can drop these in the bucket as it comes down your row. So two things I wanted to say. Um, we're going to kind of get into our time of offering today. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor Aaron mentioned that we were going to be changing to a new giving software for this week. You can still use the three ways that we have to give with uh, push pay or the envelopes or texting the number on the screen, but if you wanted to start getting yourself familiar with the new giving app, if you look on the back of your worship guide, there's a QR code there. For those of you that don't know what that is, don't worry. We're going to help you out next Sunday and get some more information to you, but you just hold this, um, your camera up to this code right here. It'll drop down our new giving app, and this is just simply because we've been using this particular software for years and years to do our accounting, and now with using this giving app, it's going to automatically transfer all of your giving for us, and it's something that we no longer have to manually do. So overall, it's a good thing. So I wanted to mention that Gift of Christmas is coming up on Christmas Day. That's something that our tithes and offerings go to. It's something that we uh, do for the community, for those who won't have a Christmas. Otherwise, it's from 2 to 4. We give them a meal. Everyone leaves with gifts that day, and it just provides an overall Christmas experience for people that wouldn't have it otherwise. And so just know that today, throughout the next couple of weeks, we're going to be getting ready for that. We will have our drop zone open at the info center. Even if you brought things today to drop off, you can leave them there, and we'll be getting ready for that. So as we prepare to give, I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll watch some video announcements. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you so much just for the opportunity that we have to give today. I thank you that even though our finances and resources may leave our hands, that they will never leave eternity. That what we give towards today is something that will never die and something that will continue on in your kingdom forever. So we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Cedar Point family. Thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. We've got some fun and exciting things going on for you and your family. Check it out. Tonight is our Advent Spectacular at 6 p.m. We will start with a special Advent service for you and your family, followed by pictures with Santa, hot cocoa, Advent wreath making, and some other fun activities. Don't forget to sign up for our Gingerbread House Contest. You can do that at cedarpoint.church. We have partnered with the Salvation Army to do bell ringing on December 7th and 14th. You can sign up for that at the Info Center. Our men's breakfast is December 5th. They will meet at 8.30 a.m. and cost us $7.50. But if it's your first time, your meal is on us. Again, thank you for spending part of your weekend with us here at Cedar Point. We'll see you next week. Well, I'm super excited for the Advent Spectacular this evening. I wanted to give just a few details to you guys before I let you go. One is, is that service will start right in here at 6 p.m., but I did want to let you know that there are a few options. Like if you don't want to come in the main worship center, you can sit right out there in an overflow section that we'll have provided, or you can go all the way down to Cedar Point Kids, and we'll be streaming the service down there as well. So if you don't want to come here and be in a crowded room, you can go to one of those two options and be able to distance in there. We'll also have Santa, like she mentioned, and then of course the gingerbread house contest, which is going to be super fun. We will have a people's choice category, so be sure that you'll make it in there tonight to vote for your favorite one. But with that, I love you guys, we love you guys, and you're dismissed. We'll see you next week.